Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Clark, Associate Director for the Consortium for Monitoring Technology and Verification. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Alexis Trahan. She's a Senior Project Lead for International Nuclear Safeguards and an R&D Engineer with the Safeguards and Science Technology Group at Los Alamos National Lab. Her technical focus is the development of detection instrumentation and analytical methods with an emphasis on neutron detection for international nuclear safeguards and nonproliferation. Uh, so please, Alexis, the floor is yours. And welcome. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me today. I am excited to talk with you about uh, my, my very favorite subject, which is non-destructive assay for nuclear safeguards. Uh, so today we're going to go through a bit of a high level overview of what is safeguards, uh, why is it important, and then we'll talk a bit more in technical detail about non-destructive assay, which is an important part of safeguards, uh, part of the whole safeguards picture, but one of the technical aspects. Uh, and then we'll get into even a bit more detail on some of the technical methods that are used uh, to perform non-destructive assay of nuclear materials. So with that, we will get started. Okay, so the International Atomic Energy Agency, I will start here with a safeguards overview. So international nuclear safeguards are a set of technical measures that are applied by the IAEA to independently verify that nuclear materials are not being diverted to illicit purposes. So this is, of course, a mission that is important to the world at large. And so safeguards is considered a, a cooperative international mission. Uh, we all work together to make sure that nuclear materials are protected and that they're not going to a weapons program. And the International Atomic Energy Agency is responsible for uh, implementing safeguards measures to do the technical verification uh, to ensure that the nuclear materials are protected. So the, some of the tools and methods that are used to implement safeguards at nuclear facilities include things like nuclear material accountancy, uh, which consists of non-destructive assay, which again, we'll be talking about today, uh, and destructive analysis. Uh, other tools and methods for implementing safeguards include containment and surveillance, things like cameras and tamper indicating devices. Uh, there's environmental sampling, uh, looking for particulates. There's uh, unattended and remote monitoring. And again, today we're going to focus on NDA. And safeguards are implemented at all parts of the nuclear fuel cycle. And for those who may not be familiar, the fuel cycle image uh, here on the right is one that I like. It's a nice simplified uh, fuel cycle description. So you start with natural uranium in the earth. It has to be mined. Uh, it's milled and converted and then enriched to make fuel. Uh, so then there's fuel fabrication, uh, after which time the fuel goes into a nuclear reactor. Uh, it comes out of the reactor as spent fuel. And then it may go to a reprocessing facility or to disposal, uh, depending on which country's fuel cycle we're looking at. So uh, the, the safeguards measures, as I've mentioned, are implemented uh, at basically all parts of the fuel cycle. And non-destructive assay is a key part of these safeguards measures. Uh, in different nuclear facilities that I've mentioned here. To give you a bit of an overview of uh, what it is that the IAEA does, uh, this is an infographic from the International Atomic Energy Agency um, showing what safeguards were implemented uh, as a summary in 2019. So as you can see here, uh, the IAEA is responsible uh, for monitoring over 200,000 significant quantities of nuclear material. Uh, and that is a lot of nuclear material. So they have an absolutely massive charge uh, in, in monitoring all of this material around the world at over 1,300 nuclear facilities. And so when I say it's really an international cooperative effort to implement safeguards, uh, you know, the IEA is an international organization and they have member states, um, you know, over 180 states with safeguards agreements in force. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of international cooperation to make safeguards happen. Uh, their resources are, uh, you know, they operate with around $140 million uh, of budget. And of course, or that might be euros, 140 million euros. 
And that is, uh, that's a relatively small budget for the massive amount of work that they do. And so people like myself uh, and others who work here at Los Alamos, a large part of what we focus on from a technical perspective is how do we enable the IEEA to do it, to accomplish this massive mission uh, with a limited budget and, and, and do more with less as time goes on. That's part of what we try to, uh, to help with. Uh, so again, this, this slide is a nice summary of, of all of the work that is being done every year. Uh, and of course, these numbers go up every year as more uh, fuel cycles continue to gain more capability uh, around the world. So a few things that the IAEA is currently working to achieve, uh, and these initiatives, of course, are uh, among many, many others. This is in addition to all the, the normal inspection work and other work that they're doing. Um, but they're working on universal acceptance of the additional protocol. And if we go back one slide, uh, you can see here that 184 states have safeguards agreements where they have agreed to have their facilities have safeguards implemented by the IAEA. And then 136 states have additional protocols in force. And so the IAEA is working on getting this number up to 184. Okay, so, uh, so additional, a universal acceptance of the additional protocol is important because it gives the IAEA some additional legal mechanisms uh, with which to implement safeguards. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is a state agreeing to essentially more potentially more inspections uh, or short notice inspections. Um, and the reason that states agree to this, why they, you know, why they agree to have more inspections or, or additional protocol um, or safeguards agreements in the first place, because this is, you know, it requires inspections of their nuclear facilities. So the reason that they agree is, is again, back to this point of it, this is an international cooperation. It's in everyone's best interest that states are not pursuing nuclear weapons programs illicitly. And so, you know, what we want, uh, and this is the global we truly, uh, is for all states to have an additional protocol uh, so that, you know, there's, there's assurance around the world that uh, everyone is pursuing peaceful nuclear power uh, if they are pursuing nuclear power and not a weapons program. Another initiative of the IAEA is safeguards by design. And this is something that if you're familiar with safeguards, you may have heard, um, which is essentially the concept of integrating safeguards into a facility's design. So instead of building a nuclear facility like a reactor and then coming in after the fact and saying, you know, how do we implement safeguards here? It's, it's considering those questions while you're building it so that it is optimized. Uh, additionally, there's unattended monitoring and data integration. Um, I mentioned the, the vast amount of work that the IAEA has to accomplish in a given year uh, to, to do their very important mission. And so the more unattended monitoring and the better data analysis and processing that we can put into place for these inspections, uh, the better poised they will be to cover, to do more with less, like I said. Okay, and then there's the state level concept. And this is something that has been, uh, you know, emerging and, and coming to the forefront of the IAEA really over the past 20 years or so, um, which is assessing each state as a whole. So instead of taking, you know, individual facility declarations and considering them one by one uh, with the safeguards implemented, it's sort of taking a step back and considering the whole state and understanding that, you know, if they have a reactor, they need to have fuel. And if they have fuel, they need to have uranium. And all of these things are connected. And so rather than considering them you know, piecemeal or one by one, we consider the state as a whole and understand uh, where to strategically put safeguards measures so that we are you know, ensuring that their material is not being uh, diverted to illicit purposes. Okay, so now we're getting into non-destructive assay. NDA, a non-destructive assay, is the most commonly employed technique for material accountancy. And essentially, it is, it is typically a series of gamma ray or neutron detectors that are used to measure radiation emitted from a sample of interest. And so parameters or uh, you know, the characteristics of the radiation that could be measured include energy, 
uh, timing, intensity of the radiation, and then those characteristics are correlated to some isotope uh, and a quantity in the sample. So there are, you can split NDA into two primary categories. Uh, there is passive non-destructive assay, where you have a sample and a detector, and you are simply measuring the radiation that's being emitted from the sample. Uh, and then there are cases where there perhaps is not enough intrinsic radiation coming from the sample uh, that you can measure it by itself. And you have to actually induce a larger signal and that would be active interrogation. So you, you would interrogate some sample uh, with you know, radiation and then you measure what is being, what has been induced in that sample. Okay, so uh, passive interrogation uh, requires that good intrinsic source, like, like I said, and a lot of times, you know, that, that intrinsic source to the materials that we're, that we're accounting for in safeguards would be plutonium, uh, and in particular, the even isotopes of plutonium, such as plutonium-240, uh, or perhaps californium. Uh, uranium, in particular, is not, does not have a good intrinsic a source, particularly for neutrons. It has a decent intrinsic gamma ray source. However, uh, with a little shielding, that could be difficult to detect. So, uh, so depending on what kind of material is being measured and characterized with non-destructive assay, you might choose either a passive method or an active method. And I'm going to keep an eye on my time here to make sure I don't talk all day. Okay, so uh, I, I like to take this opportunity, and now that we've talked about NDA kind of at large, to discuss the difference between neutrons and photons as NDA signatures. Um, a lot of students who, who study nuclear engineering will spend a lot of time thinking about photons or thinking about gamma ray detection, and perhaps less time thinking about neutrons. And it kind of requires a shift in headspace uh, to, to get from neutron detection to gamma ray and vice versa. So I like to point out some of the key differences. So first of all, there's of course the origins of the radiation. Uh, so for neutrons, what we're typically measuring is neutrons from spontaneous and induced fission. That is, that is the largest source of neutrons typically in the kinds of materials that we are interested in uh, in safeguards, being you know, often uranium and plutonium. There could also be a fairly significant alpha N source where you have an alpha particle that's emitted from some higher actinide. It interacts with a low Z material such as uh, oxygen or hydrogen or uh, carbon, and it emits a single neutron. And then there are some less common neutron sources such as uh, cosmic ray burst interactions, uh, proton neutron, N2N, or gamma N. But those are typically statistically insignificant in the NDA measurements that we're talking about here. Uh, on the photon side, the origins are if, if they come from the nucleus, then we call the photons gamma rays. Uh, if they come from a nuclear collision, they would also be classified as gamma rays. Uh, if they come from the electron cloud, then they are X-rays. And so the so the different origins, there of course are also gamma rays from fission, um, but that would be the, uh, yeah, from the nucleus. Okay, so then the signal, and this is a really, really important one. Uh, when we think about gamma ray detection, we often are almost always really are looking at energy and intensity. So how many gamma rays of a certain energy are we detecting? And then can we use that value or those values to say how much mass of this isotope is present? With neutrons, much of the time we're looking at time and correlations. So you can do neutron energy detection, but for a lot of the sources that we're interested in, again, neutrons coming from fission, uh, they're emitted in a watt spectrum and getting the energy of the neutron actually doesn't help us all that much with what we are trying to learn about the material. And so often we will look at time and correlations, meaning how many times or how often are we detecting correlated neutrons? And I'm going to go into more detail about what that means, so I won't harp on that just, just yet. Uh, so shielding is also very different for neutrons and photons. We shield neutrons with low Z materials such as high density polyethylene um, or hydrogenous materials such as uh, water. 
uh, or HDP. Uh, and with photons, we shield with a high Z material, so something like lead or tungsten. For the detectors, uh, some common neutron detectors include helium-3, and that's what I'll talk a bit more about today are some helium-3 systems. Uh, scintillators, liquid scintillators or plastic could be used. And then fission chambers are another common neutron detector in safeguards. Uh, in, for photons, some common detectors include high-purity germanium, again, scintillators, so they are a dual particle detector, uh, sodium iodide, CZT or cadmium centelluride and lanthanum bromide. All right, so we're going to start with neutrons. And as Sean said in my introduction, uh, my, my area of focus, of technical focus, is in neutron detection. So you're going to notice that I, I have a bit more content on neutrons here, but hopefully, again, that balances out. I, I, I tend to notice a lot of students do more, spend more time looking at gamma ray detection than neutron detection. So today we'll, we'll give you a bit more time on neutrons. Okay. So some of the history of neutron counting for non-destructive assay. Uh, back in the day when computers were considerably slower and we did not have really advanced pulse processing electronics and things like we have today, the main way, the main methodology of neutron counting was just total neutron detection. So what's the total number of neutrons that we detect from a sample in a given amount of time? Uh, and so this can give you mass information. You can take that and, and back out a mass, but you have to have a lot of other information and you can really only get an accurate measurement or assay for a few types of special nuclear material. So then as data processing improved and as we got smarter and faster computers, uh, we evolved to coincidence counting. And at this point we were looking at recording the number of times that we get two neutrons arriving within a set time window that we call a gate. And coincidence counting to this day has wide applications for international safeguards uh, because that is a, a key signature of fissioning material is emitting correlated neutrons. So a fission event will emit multiple neutrons typically um, at a time. And by detecting those neutrons, those correlated neutrons, we can say with a certain amount of certainty uh, that there has been fission taking place. And so this is a very useful and unique signature uh, to fission, which makes it very unique and, and useful for safeguards measurements. Okay, so then again, computers got better and faster, and we evolved to multiplicity counting. Uh, and this also requires much more elaborate detector setups, um, but it is essentially an extension of coincidence counting. So instead of saying, how many times did we detect two neutrons close together in time? We'll say, how many times did we detect two neutrons? How many times did we detect three neutrons or four? And so on. And so by, by adding these additional measured parameters, we can also solve for additional parameters of the material or item that we're measuring. And so if there is something like an impurity in a sample, uh, you may not be able to characterize the sample mass with the coincidence counting method unless you're able to correct for that impurity. But with neutron multiplicity counting, you can essentially directly solve for the parameters of interest uh, which enables you to, you know, characterize a lot more diverse samples. Um, there are also drawbacks to multiplicity counting, especially that you need a lot of efficiency. You need a very high efficiency detector, and uh, and it can take quite a bit of time. And so, you know, there are trade-offs. And basically, if coincidence counting will give you the answer that you need, that is typically the method of choice. Uh, if you need something, you know, you need more information to characterize the sample, then you might turn to multiplicity counting. Okay, here's an example of, of a, a clearly a very basic setup of what a coincidence counter might look like. Uh, you might have helium-3 neutron detectors in a circle around a fissioning source. So that circle arrangement gives you a higher efficiency, a higher detection efficiency. Um, we call that a well configuration. And you have your fissioning source in the center so that as neutrons are emitted from your fissioning source, you detect them, hopefully, uh, in your ring of helium-3 tubes. Now, if this were 
um, a multiplicity counter, then you would see the rings build up. And I think I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. Uh, so we are detecting here the prompt neutrons from fission. Uh, and ideally, you'll detect multiple neutrons from the same fission event, which gives you a coincidence. OK. So now, uh, as, as promised, we're going to talk a bit more about what coincidence counting actually is. So if up until this point, I've been describing detecting neutrons close together in time from fission, and you've thought to yourself, well, there are all these different fission events happening in an item. How would I possibly know if two neutrons came from the same fission event or a different fission event or an alpha N event for that matter? Um, if, if that's the thought that crossed your mind, you are right on, <laughs> perfect. Um, because yes, that is, uh, that is the challenge. And so essentially the answer to that question is statistics. And I'm gonna try to show you exactly how this works. So imagine that we have a spontaneous fission event in our sample, and that event emits three neutrons. So let's say two of those neutrons manage to thermalize and be detected in our detector system. Then we're going to track through time, the time of detection of these neutrons. So there we've got one tick mark on our axis of time. We've got our second neutron, which maybe spent a bit more time thermalizing or getting to a thermal um, or slow uh, energy. And so we detect it a bit later in time. And there's our second tick. And we'll say that the third neutron from this fission event went on to induce another fission. This time, one neutron escaped and the other neutron induced another fission. And now from this fission event, we get another neutron detection. And this happens some amount of time later, uh, whatever time elapsed between that first and third fission. Okay, we have two more neutrons escape, one more causes another fission. And this process goes on until all the neutrons either escape or are detected. And then this fission chain is complete. So what we have here is a set of correlated neutrons. These neutrons all came from either the same fission event and I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but so they came from the same fission event in this case, um, or for all these neutrons, they came from the same fission chain. So they are by definition correlated. Now, what's the problem with this? The problem is that there are tons of fissions and tons of fission chains happening simultaneously in our sample. And so what we actually have is something more like this, where we have well, something more like this times 100 or 1,000 or a million or 10 million, right? We have tons and tons of overlapping fission chains that are starting at different times and the, all their neutron detections are just overlapping in our detector. And so we have to be able to pull out here, where, where are the correlated neutrons? Which ones actually came from the same fission or fission chain and which ones came from different fissions and fission chains? And we do that through statistics. So with we, what we do is we, we go back to this, we take the time between every one of these neutron detections and we plot that. And that gives us what's called a Rossi alpha distribution. And so what you see here is you see this hump early in time and the X axis here is time between neutron detections. So when we have a fissioning source, because neutrons are emitted simultaneously, we are more likely to detect them close together in time than far apart in time. So we get this hump. We get this, uh, this increase here in neutrons detected close together versus far apart in time. And this little increase is just because of detector dead time. So we won't worry about that for the moment. Uh, so this is what we're looking for. We're looking for this, this increase. And if I were with you guys in person, I would be asking this question right now. Um, so feel free to answer it in the chat if you would like. But the, the question is, let's say we, instead of a fissioning source, we have an alpha N source. So we have a, an item that is emitting one neutron at a time, okay? So they're not being emitted in pairs or in sets of three or four. It's a single neutron being emitted uh, from reactions that are uncorrelated to one another. Then what does this distribution look like? And I'll give a second in case anyone wants to answer in the chat.
a peak to wall effect. Okay, that sounds like gammas, but you're, I, I see where your head's at. Good. Any other guesses? Okay, so essentially the idea here is that neutrons are no more likely to be detected close together in time than far apart in time or medium apart in time, right? Neutrons are being emitted randomly one at a time. Uh, and so what we get is a flat distribution or random points. I think that that's, that's where you're headed with that. So what we have is, is essentially just, just a flat distribution. You're no more likely to have close detections than far apart. Um, and, and that's what you would get if you had an alpha N source. And so if you think about that, that's a really unique and, uh, and it, it makes it so that if you can produce this distribution, you can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that you either have a fissioning source or you do not have a fissioning source. Uh, this unique hump in the beginning, this correlated uh, peak here is what is telling you that you have a fissioning source. Okay. So that was that was a really, uh, in, we'll say it was pretty in-depth <laughs> overview of neutron coincidence counting for uh, a 45 minute talk, but hopefully it gave you a bit of an idea of, of how we do neutron uh, coincidence counting in order to detect fissions. And so what you see here is a multiplicity counter. Uh, so this has 121 helium-3 tubes. This is a very uh, elaborate detector system. It has a very high efficiency of 65%. That's the, uh, that's the efficiency of a Californium source in the center of this well. Um, and you need that high efficiency to get triples because the efficiency of, of triples counting is essentially the, the efficiency of a single neutron detection cubed. Um, and so you have to you have to start with a very high efficiency for a single neutron detection in order to get triples. Okay. Uh, and then a quick example of how you might put neutron coincidence counting into action uh, is the advanced experimental fuel counter. So this is an instrument where uh, it is an active neutron interrogation. Um, instrument and it does neutron coincidence counting. So what you have, this is, you see here on the left, uh, the instrument itself, it's, it's fairly small. It's for research reactor fuel. And on the right, you see like an MCNP schematic here of what the inside looks like. So you have a Californium source here. That Californium source is emitting neutrons. Those neutrons thermalize in the water. They induce fission in the fissile mass in your fuel. And then hopefully the, the correlated neutrons from those fission events will be detected in your moderated helium-3 tubes. And that is, that is essentially how it works. It's looking for neutron coincidences from the fuel. And in doing so, it can correlate the mass of fissile material in the fuel uh, to that coincidence count, the coincident neutron detection rate. Uh, and so we see something like this. We have our fissile mass on one axis. We have the, the doubles or the coincident neutron count on the x-axis and the fissile mass on the y-axis. And then we get this nice calibration curve. Uh, so then you can measure some unknown fuel assembly. You can get the doubles rate, put it on this curve and predict the fissile mass. Okay. Moving on to gamma rays. So the generic assay equation is essentially the mass of special nuclear material is correlated to the measured radiation rate, or essentially the counts per unit of time, times some correction factor, which is there to correct for losses due to things like item self-absorption, container absorption, um, and measurement system electronics, maybe dead time. And then that is divided by a calibration constant. So there's clearly a lot of correction or calibration in this, but like I said, this is the generic assay equation. Uh, and and what, to, what you should take away from this is that you're, you're backing out your mass of, of nuclear material or your mass of an isotope essentially directly from this, uh, the measured radiation rate or the intensity of the radiation at some uh, energy. And so there are uh, software systems designed to do isotopic analysis, particularly for, uh, again, the materials of interest to safeguards, uh, plutonium and uranium. 
So from is one example of that. It's fixed energy response function analysis with multiple efficiencies. Uh, it does self calibration by measuring some known gamma ray peaks uh, and then calibrating, doing an energy calibration. Uh, it has user editable analysis parameters so that you can uh, back out the mass of the item that you're interested in. And it works with a variety of detectors. Uh, so this is an example of what it looks like, what it looks, the output from FROM looks like. Uh, so you get, you might measure something like this blue curve here. And then FROM will do this peak fitting where it, it figures out what are the composite, what are the peaks that are actually being emitted from your item or your material and that are adding up to produce this measured curve. Uh, and that will give you then the uh, isotopic breakdown of what item you're looking at. Another example of, of gamma ray detection uh, put into practice for safeguards is the passive gamma emission tomography or PJET system. So this is a uh, spent fuel measurement system. I think I've given away now that I do spent fuel measurements, so I, I like spent fuel examples. Uh, so this is, this is actually a power reactor spent fuel measurement system, um, arguably one of the most advanced spent fuel measurement systems in the world, if not the most advanced. Um, it has, it is doing three simultaneous measurements. It's doing gross neutron or total neutron. It's doing gamma spectroscopy. So it's measuring, um, you know, the peaks like we just talked about, and it's doing 2D emission tomography. So what it does is, is it creates an axial image of the emission locations so that it can detect pin level diversions. So from this picture, you can see that there's a pin diverted. Um, and that's what that what this system is used for largely is to you know, take, uh, take a radiation picture of a fuel assembly to, to see whether a pin has been removed. Uh, additionally, it can take, it uses neutron data uh, to verify or confirm the burn up uh, declaration. And it uses the gamma ray spectroscopy data to verify or uh, determine the cooling time. Uh, it could also verify using the gamma ray spectroscopy non-fuel items. So you could imagine that you could put some dummy material here that, that might look like fuel, uh, but using you know, these additional checks that are built into the instrument, you could say that it's a non-fuel item versus fuel. Uh, and it's been tested for a range of burnups and cooling times uh, and is being implemented now uh, at the IAEA. And last, we're gonna talk about heat, which I really have not mentioned up till this point, um, but it is, it is a method also for non-destructive assay is measuring the heat emitted from an item. Um, so the most, at the most basic level, uh, calorimetry is, is really a well-established and precise method of non-destructive assay where you're using the thermal power that's generated by radioactive decay to determine the mass of a special nuclear material. Um, heat flow calorimetry is the most commonly used method for uh, materials control and accounting of, of the calorimetry methods. Um, it is used here at Los Alamos to do uh, plutonium and tritium measurements. And uh, the reason that, and like I said, it is, it is well established and it's a precise and accurate method. Um, however, it takes quite a bit of time to reach equilibrium, to reach thermal equilibrium in these systems. And so because it takes longer than other non-destructive assay techniques, it's really not implemented much by the IAEA. Um, IAEA inspections need to be relatively quick uh, and they need to be you know, not intrusive or, or not interrupting a facility's uh, operations. And so, uh, so this, you know, calorimetry is not implemented as much by the IAEA, but it is a common method for materials control and accountancy. Uh, so I did want to at least have a slide uh, raising the point. And then microcalorimetry. Uh, so this is really an up and coming uh, method for safeguards as well as other verification um, applications. And so what it, the, the concept of microcalorimetry is that you have an ultra high energy resolution microcalorimeter um, that can detect essentially the heat of a single gamma ray uh, that, is, that a single gamma ray deposits in the detector. And it offers a path to overcome current NDA performance limits that are based on uh, things like, like energy resolution. 
Uh, and I really like this plot down on the right here, where you can see a curve from high purity germanium, which is really considered to be the state of the art in many ways of gamma spectroscopy uh, versus what you get from microcalorimetry. And you can see just considerably more fidelity here. You know, you have four peaks within a single KEV uh, energy range. So, you know, microcalorimetry might offer uh, a, a really advanced way of doing gamma spectroscopy with far better accuracy than, than current methods, but um, it's still being developed and, and implemented, you know, at a, at a larger scale, but there's quite a bit of microcalorimetry research going on at Los Alamos. Um, and, and I think it's a really interesting kind of method of the future for NDA. So I wanted to bring it up today. Uh, so as I mentioned, they measure the, the heat energy of individual photons or nuclear decays, uh, which gives you, and it uses a, an ultra cool uh, or ultra low temperature detector uh, in order to do that. So currently the systems are fairly large and, and, um, and not super easy to move around, which limits the applicability of the system. But as, as microcalorimetry research evolves, uh, I think we'll see these detectors get smaller and more portable um, and have more application spaces. So an exciting new area. Okay, and this is just another nice plot of, uh, of how the, um, of how the, uh, the microcalorimetry measurements have quite a bit more fidelity than something like high purity germanium. So I'm going to end, and good, I'm, I'm about on time here, uh, talking about Safeguard's research at Los Alamos. So essentially everything I have mentioned up until this point has been uh, Safeguard's research that is, is taking place or was done uh, at Los Alamos with PJET being the, ex the uh, exception. Um, but we, we are doing a lot of microcalorimetry research. Uh, the Advanced Experimental Fuel Counter, AEFC was developed here. Um, and developing non-destructive assay systems is, is kind of our bread and butter. We've been doing that uh, to support the IEA for over 50 years. And so there's, there's the slide with some nice pictures uh, of some of the work that we've done, um, but technology development in particular, like I said, non-destructive assay systems um, is, is a foundational part of what we do here at Los Alamos, and especially in the Safeguard Science and Technology Group. Um, almost every helium-3 based, uh, you know, system that the IAEA uses for, uh, for inspections was developed here, um, and almost all of them by Howard Menlove, who you see in the upper right corner, uh, who Howard has been at Los Alamos for almost 50 years, or maybe a little over 50 years, so he's been here about as long as our safeguards program has existed. Uh, we also have a great deal of training that we do here at Los Alamos. Uh, we train IAEA inspectors, um, with the exception of last year in COVID, uh, we have trained every IAEA inspector um, every year since the 1980s. Uh, they've come to Los Alamos for, for training in non-destructive assay. And we really focus on learning how to think critically about non-destructive assay measurements and improve your measurements and, and understand the data you're collecting as opposed to just running instruments. Um, so I think that over the years we've evolved and have really high quality NDA training that we put on many, many times a year uh, nowadays. Uh, and then we have a lot of expertise. So we lend our expertise to the IAEA in the form of um, cost-free experts that go over and work with the IAEA on developing tools and, and technologies. Uh, we develop uh, you know, the technology that, that will directly go over to the IAEA. Uh, we do policy analysis uh, for safeguards at the IAEA. Um, so quite a bit of work done to support them here. And then lastly, I'll put in a plug that if you're familiar with the passive non-destructive assay or PANDA manual, um, we are updating the PANDA manual, which is very exciting. So the last version was published, or the only version was published in about 1990. Uh, there was an, uh, so a few addenda that were added in the early 2000s, but we are rewriting the whole book uh, and it is almost done. So there will be new addenda. We will be discussing new technologies that have emerged in the last 30 years since the last version of Panda, uh, new characterization methods, new electronics, and much more. So, uh, so this is, is a work in progress that is almost done and, uh, and we're excited that we'll have a new version of this soon. 
Uh, and then for my last note before I take questions, um, if any of this has caught your attention and your interest, and you are currently looking for a job uh, for a postdoctoral research position uh, or something of the like, please contact me. Um, I would be really interested in hearing and talking with you, uh, and we are hiring at the moment. So, um, so with that, thank you very much again, and I am happy to take questions. Great. Thanks, Alexis, so much for a great presentation.